Good morning. I'm Stephen Leake. I'm an elder at First Presbyterian Church of Mesquite, Texas, and I'm also the teacher of the Discipleship Sunday School class there. Today we're continuing with our study of the Gospel of John. And let me remind you that our curriculum is based on the daily Bible study series by Professor William Barclay. And the version of the Bible that we're using for our study is the new Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is the version of the Bible that we use there in our church. Last week, we began to study the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And last week, we read the scripture and we discussed the logistical situation there, the geography, and the other factors that went into the story. Today we're going to discuss the meaning of the story. And to get us started, I'm going to reread the scripture, which comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one of them to get a little. But one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they fill 12 baskets. We'll never know exactly what happened on that grassy plain near Bethsaida, Julius. We may look at it in three ways. First, we may regard it as a miracle in which Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. Some may find that hard to conceive of, and many may find it hard to reconcile with the fact that that is just what Jesus refused to do at his temptation. That recorded in Matthew chapter 4, verse 34. But if we can believe in the sheer miraculous character of this miracle, we'll continue to do so. But if we're puzzled, there are two other explanations. Second, it may be that this was really a sacrament a sacramental meal in the rest of the chapter the language of jesus is exactly like that of the last supper there he speaks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood it could be that at this meal it was but a, but a morsel like the sacrament that each person received and that the thrill and the wonder and the presence of Jesus and the reality of God turned it into a religious experience. This experience was profound, something that nourished their hearts and souls, as happens at every communion service today. I remember as a boy driving back from East Texas one cold, rainy Sunday night with my father we could only get one station on the car radio, and that was the church service. Well, the service culminated in the Lord's Supper, and we had no elements, so my dad reached into his shirt pocket and got a lifesaver candy out for each one of us. 
that was the host for our communion. And it's the most memorable Lord's Supper in my memory. Third, there may be another explanation. It would not be practical for the crowd to embark on a nine-mile expedition without making any preparations at all. And if there were pilgrims in the group on their way to Jerusalem, they would certainly possess supplies. But it may be that they would not produce what they had, for they selfishly and very humanly wish to keep it all for themselves. It may be then that Jesus, with a rare smile of his, produced the little store that he and his disciples had. And with a sunny faith, he thanked God for it, and he shared it out. Moved by his example, everyone who had anything did the same. And in the end, there was enough, and more than enough, for all. It may be that this is a miracle in which the presence of Jesus turned a crowd of selfish people into a fellowship of sharers. It may be that this story represents the biggest miracle of all, one which changed not loaves and fishes, but men and women. However that may be, there were certain people there without whom the miracle could not have been possible. First, there was Andrew. And there's a contrast, a sharp contrast between Andrew and Philip. Philip said, the situation is hopeless. Nothing can be done. Andrew was the man who said, I'll see what I can do and I'll trust Jesus to do the rest. It was Andrew who brought that young boy to Jesus and by bringing him made the miracle possible. No one ever knows what will come out of it when we bring someone to Jesus. If parents train up their children in the knowledge and the love and the fear of God, no one can say what mighty things those children may someday do for God and for others. If a Sunday school teacher brings a child to Christ, no one knows what that child may do someday. Andrew did not know what he was doing when he brought that boy to Jesus that day, but he was providing material for a miracle. We never know what possibilities we are releasing when we bring someone to Jesus. Second, there was the boy. He had not much to offer, but in what he had, Jesus found the materials of a miracle. There would have been one great deed fewer in history if that boy had withheld his loaves and fishes. Jesus needs what we can bring him. It may not be much, but he needs it. It may well be that the world has denied miracle after miracle because we do not bring to Jesus what we have. If we would lay ourselves at the altar of his service, there's no telling what he could do with us and through us. And we may be sorry and embarrassed that we do not have more to bring. But that's no reason for failing to bring what we have. Little is much in the hands of Christ. Now we'll continue on in the book of John, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were, talk were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Here is the reaction of the crowd. The Jews were waiting for the prophet whom they believed Moses had promised. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. That from Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. In that moment they were willing to accept Jesus as the prophet and carry him to power. But it was not long before another crowd was clamoring, Crucify him! Why was it that at that moment the crowd acclaimed Jesus? 
For one thing, they were eager to support Jesus when he gave them what they wanted. He had healed them and fed them, and they would have made him their leader. And there's such a thing as bought loyalty. And there's such a thing as covered love. Some philosophers define gratitude as a lively sense of favor still to come. The attitude of the crowd disgusts us, but are we really so different? We want comfort in sorrow, strength in difficulty, peace in turmoil, and help in the face of depression. There's no one so wonderful as Jesus, and we talk to him and walk with him and open our hearts to him. But when he demands sacrifice, when he challenges us, we have nothing to do with him. When we examine ourselves, it may be that we too love Jesus for what we can get out of him. The crowd wish to use him for their own purposes. Again, are we so different? We appeal to Christ for strength and power, not for humility and obedience to accept his plans. We would like Christ's gifts without his cross. We would like to use him instead of following him. Well, that's our lesson for today. Thank you for joining me, and God bless you all.